Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. I'm Jean Deville, joined as always by my co-host, Blaine Curcio. This week, we dedicate the episode specifically to the successful launch of the Series 1 rocket, as well as its five payloads. And this will be followed by an exclusive interview of Galactic Energy, the company that manufactured the rocket. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. The lead story of this week is undoubtedly the successful launch of the Series 1 small lift solid field rocket from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center by the Chinese launch startup Galactic Energy. Galactic Energy was founded in 2018, so quite a few years after Landspace, iSpace, OneSpace, and LinkSpace, the companies that are generally referred to as the first generation commercial launch companies in China. But despite this late start, Galactic Energy has been moving very fast, especially in November 2020, they became the second commercial company ever in China to put a payload into orbit with their Series 1 rocket. And this was barely 16 months after iSpace with the Hyperbola 1 had done the same thing in July 2019. So the latest successful launch of the Series 1 rocket is actually the second success in a row of Galactic Energy. And arguably, this gives them the title of the leading Chinese commercial launch company in China. And this is because the only other launch company that has managed to put something into orbit, iSpace, with their Hyperbola 1 rocket, well, they failed their second and third attempts of orbital launch. And this also maybe tends to highlight a higher reliability of the Series 1 rocket. Although before making this kind of statement, we probably need more data points over the next one, two, or three years because these um, rocket companies are still extremely early stage. Now, before getting into the details of the payloads that were put into space, let's first discuss a little bit the rocket family of galactic energy. So the company is planning two rockets, right? There's the Series 1 four-stage small-lift launch vehicle, which is able to put 350 kilograms into low-Earth orbit. It is powered by solid field engines for the first three stages, and it has an additional liquid field upper stage. And this rocket aims at a market of, quoting them here, narrowband Internet of Things satellite constellation deployment and constellation supplemental launches. And as mentioned, the Series 1 has now flown twice. They're also planning a second rocket, the Palace rocket, uh, which is a much larger two-stage liquid field Kerolox rocket that is able to put four to five tons into LEO. And it has the specificity of being reusable. It is able to perform vertical landing similar to a SpaceX Falcon 9. And this rocket will have a maiden launch in the early stages of 2023, according to the latest reports from CCAF, the Chinese Commercial Aerospace Forum. And actually, Galactic Energy is even planning a larger version of this rocket, some sort of a palace heavy rocket, which will have two additional side boosters and that will be able to put 14 tons into low Earth orbit. Now let's move on to the payloads that were put into space last week by the Series 1. There are a lot of interesting nuggets of information that we can dig into. So firstly, there were two satellites that were manufactured by Space-T, which is a commercial satellite manufacturer that we've mentioned quite a few times in past episodes. And both of these satellites were CubeSats. We first had the Leeds one which was a 6U CubeSat with a payload coming from two commercial companies based in Beijing. We had the Raychun Satellite Innovation Application Institute and another company called Insights Value. And this 6U CubeSat aimed at constellation deployment technology verification. So I have no idea what exactly that is referring to, so make of that what you will. And the second satellite by Spacey, perhaps more interestingly, the Bao Yun satellite is a 20-ish kilogram 12U satellite that is a technology verification satellite for the Tianzhuan constellation that we mentioned in a past episode. And this constellation, this satellite was jointly developed by BUPT, the Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications, by Huawei Cloud, China Mobile, and Beijing University. And the Tianzhuan constellation is sort of a on-orbit open source processing platform. And this Balian satellite actually came quite as a surprise because in the previous sort of press release about this constellation, they had mentioned that the first launch would take place in May, 2022. Now, admittedly, this current launch of the Balian satellite is not the deployment of the constellation. It's more of a technology verification test, but still we were not expecting things to move so quickly after the announcement. So definitely uh, we can expect this constellation to move quite fast. 
Um, also, very interestingly about this Baoyun satellite, there was a secondary payload, a GNSS radio occultation payload by another Chinese company called Yunyao Yuhang. And this payload basically enables Yunyao Yuhang, the company, to gather meteorological data based on the refraction of GNSS radio signals through the atmosphere. And we discussed this previously in the in a past episode, so I won't get too much into detail into what that is. But basically, radio waves, as they go through the atmosphere, are refracted. And this refraction depends on water vapor, pressure, and also temperature. And so by measuring the refraction, we can track down and measure, actually, the value of these various meteorological parameters. Just a quick digression on Yunyang Yuhang. They're a very interesting company that's planning this 80 satellite remote sensing constellation based on this technology, GNSS radio occultation, and they plan to fully deploy this constellation by 2023. But what's very interesting about this company is that they seem to not want to have satellites of their own. They seem to want to piggyback satellites from other companies. And so Baoyun is a very good example, but they also previously piggybacked this year the Quanfu O1B satellite of CGSTL, where they added their secondary payload. And same thing for the Hangsheng manufactured Zhongan Guotong-1 satellite, also I believe launched earlier this year. So lots of piggybacking, but also there was a third satellite of this week's launch, which also had a payload from Yunyao Yuhang, and that is the Tianjin University one satellite of the Changchun-based company, CGSTL. And actually, this third satellite, as far as I know, it's the first time that Yunyao Yuhang is putting their payload as the main payload of a satellite, but it's sort of shared with CGSTL. CGSTL is also a remote sensing satellite company that is managing the Jilin-1 remote sensing constellation. This constellation is more focused on hyperspectral, on high resolution imaging, on video imaging, things like that. And so they don't have radio occultation payloads. And so by having, you know, their platform, but Yunyao Yuhang's payload, well, I guess this is possibly a way for Yunyao Yuhang to share the costs. They share the data as well. And so it's a win-win for both companies. So very interesting, I think, uh, company, Yunyao Yuhang, and their strategy regarding just putting payloads into space. Blaine, do you have any, any thoughts on these couple of companies before moving on to the other satellites? Yeah, definitely. So I think just the, the sort of Yunyao Yuhang example of they're able to piggyback across a number of different satellites manufactured by a number of different manufacturers, as it were. Um, it's really, I think, a comment to the the modularity and the flexibility of the Chinese commercial space ecosystem. So we you know, I think we underestimate how complicated it might be to put a relatively small payload onto a relatively small satellite and just have that payload work exactly as it would on some different satellite. So I think a lot of apparent, um, again, modularity, coordination, flexibility of this industrial base that we're starting to see develop. So, um, yeah, really an interesting company to keep an eye on, the uh, Yunyao Yuhang. They're quite stealthy, I think. So I guess a couple of additional points on some of these payloads. So first, I think it, it's important to, uh, to note the very clear clustering of Tianjin-related companies in a couple of these satellites. So we've spoken a couple of times about Tianjin, but just a little bit of context. So it's a large port city of about 15 million people, uh, around 100 kilometers or maybe 45 to 60 minutes by high-speed rail uh, to the east of, of the capital of Beijing. And it's relatively close location to Beijing means that Tianjin uh, can sometimes be you know, overshadowed. I mean, Beijing is such a huge center of, of the Chinese space sector that you know Tianjin, it's, it's hard to, um, to keep up. So first, John, to your earlier point, there was a Tianjin University satellite developed with CGSTL, so this Earth Observation Satellite uh, that is manufactured by, or that is at least partly manufactured by the local university. Um, I think, however, more interestingly is that on two of the SpaceCity satellites, we saw collaboration between SpaceCity and a company called Tianjin Huaxin Technology Limited, and this was collaboration for Tianjin Huaxin to build the high-performance inertial measurement units on the two SpaceCity satellites, and this was the second such collaboration that these two companies have had following the similar collaboration on the Yuan Guanghao satellite that was launched in late 2020. And I think more interestingly from Hua Xin, the company is apparently developing uh, space grade semiconductors, which is clearly a pretty cutting edge and important area for the Chinese space industrial base moving forward. So I think definitely a company to keep an eye on. And noteworthily, this is an area that's in a, a free trade zone. And so there's a lot of different government incentives. And this is the area where, where Hua Xin is, is headquartered. And so we have, I think this um, Hua Xin, you have other companies like iStar Aerospace and indeed like um, Yunyao Yuhang that are all seemingly clustering around this, this part of Tianjin. And so moving forward, I mean, Tianjin as a municipality, it is heavily indebted. It is probably not the most financially flexible city in China, but it is nonetheless a very large city. It is a provincial level city, which is to say um, it has a certain level of autonomy and it has, a, I think, a fair amount of political uh, power to where it could, if it really wanted to, develop a space industry ecosystem around uh, within the city. So 
Um, definitely, I think a city to keep an eye on is, uh, is Tianjin in the context of, uh, of the space sector moving forward. And again, I think this launch is definitely an example of that. So last point about this launch that I'd like to discuss, you have two satellites that were the Golden Bohemia 5 and Golden Bohemia 301 that are part of the, as it were, named Golden Bohemia constellation of HKATG. So just a couple of quick points to unpack on HKATG. So the company based in Hong Kong was formerly known as Hong Kong Aerospace and Technology Group. And they have for a couple of years now been developing a business model that I have kind of very two distinct minds about. So basically the business model is a satellite constellation, and it's not entirely clear whether that would be you know, purely remote sensing or Internet of Things or some communications, but a satellite uh, constellation that is focused on the Greater Bay Area or the GBA, which is this very large sort of megacity or you know, cluster of megacities in southern China. It includes areas like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Dongguan. So you're looking at, you know, maybe 100 million people. Yeah. And so, I, again, there's two sides of this business model that you could think of. It's like, well, one, you know, the Greater Bay Area is the most urbanized part of one of the most well-connected countries in the world. Everyone in the Greater Bay Area pretty much has decent internet access. If not at home, there is 4G or 5G everywhere. And so the idea that you could have a value add from a satellite constellation for IoT or for remote sensing or for anything, it, it, it's kind of hard to imagine because again, all of these buildings, all of these places, they're already so very well connected. And so it's hard to really think, well, uh, the other point I think is that, you know, any satellite constellation that's focused on one very small area, um, almost by definition, there's a high level of inefficiency, right? It's a global constellation. And so why wouldn't they just be, you know, renting earth observation capacity or, you know, buying EO data from some existing operator just over the GBA. So on that side of the things, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. That being said, when you look at the the size of the economy of the Greater Bay Area, I mean, this is a more than one trillion US dollar per year economy. And so you have a situation where even a very, very, very small increase in efficiency or a very small uh, you know, increase in, in R&D capabilities or, or just anything that makes the GBA even a tiny bit more productive, it's probably worth some you know couple of tens of millions of dollars of investment. So Again, I, I'm still not entirely sold on the, the, the concept of this business, but um, to their credit, despite my skepticism over these couple of years, they've since raised some money. They've gone public on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange through a kind of uh, Hong Kong version of a SPAC, and uh, they've now launched multiple more satellites. So it seems that despite my doubts, they have um, they are continuing to move forward. So interestingly, the two satellites that they, that they launched this week, they were manufactured by two different satellite manufacturers. So the first was manufactured by the Z, uh, Zero Gravity Labs, and the second one by Zhongke Xingri. And according to an official press release from Hong Kong ATG or HKATG, the two satellites are both optical remote sensing, of which Golden Bikini F5 is equipped with an industrial grade optical camera. And so the last point about HKATG that I think is perhaps most notable is that they have mentioned, quote, we may explore into optical and SAR remote sensing satellite constellation systems. Um, so this being but the latest Chinese company to have announced looking into the possibility of going into SAR. And uh, we did indeed have an episode a couple of months ago entitled SAR Wars. I encourage you to check it out, if for no other reason than the pretty cool title and the relatively low view count for having such a cool title. So check it out. Um, now that you've heard our, all of our take on the, uh, the Series 1 launch and all the related updates, um, we do invite an extra special guest to give us some insights straight from the horse's mouth, that being Mr. Liu Hong from launch manufacturer and arguably China's leading commercial launch manufacturer now with two successful launches, Galactic Energy. And first of all, I would like to welcome Mr. Liu Hong, systems engineer from Galactic Energy, to the Dongfang Hour. So, Mr. Liu, first of all, a congratulations on the second successful launch of the Series 1 rocket last week. Two successful launches in a row for a Chinese commercial company. That is a first. And so before we get started, could you just give a brief introduction of yourself to our viewers and listeners? Yes, sure. It's my pleasure to join this program. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Liu Hong, a systems engineer at Galactic Energy. My responsibility is to provide configuration management, design trade-off studies, and interfaces definition during design, validation, and verification and flight test phases of the Series 1 launch vehicle in order to achieve balanced results that fulfill the defined needs and requirements within constraints. I collaborate with structural engineers, electrical engineers, propulsion engineers, and many other colleagues in our team. Yeah, that definitely sounds uh, fascinating. Also, a lot of compromise to be had with different engineering departments out there. 
maybe let me just fire off my my first question, which is um, that as Blaine mentioned, so the the successful launch of the Series One rocket over the past week. This is this is a big success. This is the second success in a row for Galactic yes. Energy, I believe, and I think this is also a first in just Chinese commercial commercial space in general, having two successes uh, in a row in terms of launch. Um, I'd like to ask, how does this second successful launch, does it change things for Galactic Energy? And what are your plans in terms of launch following this success? Yes, so this is the first time that a private company, a uh, space company in China has achieved two consecutive successful launches into orbit. So this has two important meanings for galactic energy. First, not only has the successful launch enhanced the confidence of China's private space companies, but that of the entire society. So up to now, China's private space companies have made several attempts to launch into orbit. However, the success rate is relatively low as compared to that achieved by well-established launch providers at home and abroad. People have been expecting China, uh, China's private launch providers to address the shortage of launch services for small satellites and to contribute more to the national space capability. The recent success has a great importance in building confidence in reaching these goals. Secondly, for a, space company, uh, for a private space company to be self-sustainable, achieving mass production is a crucial step. The second successful launch of the Series 1 and rocket has its importance in this regard. Furthermore, the recent success is a milestone for uh, China's private space industry as it's marked the turning point from experimental launch phase to, to full commercialization of a launch vehicle. The experience, this experience may be valuable for other private space companies in China as well. And, and ju just to expand a tiny bit on that, um, do you know, if following this launch, since it has been a success, are you able to reveal to us if there are any future launches that are planned for the Series 1 in the coming months? Yeah, sure. So uh, we are uh, planning five launches in the, in the next year. And uh, um, so all of them will be uh, Series 1 ro uh, rocket launches. And uh, um, I think we are actively preparing for the next launch. Um, in our uh, in our company. Thanks for that. That is uh, that is very helpful. Um, maybe now in terms of where Galactic Energy is planning to launch these rockets. Just for our viewers, China has four traditional launch sites: Taiyuan, Jiuquan, Xichang, Wenchang. Those four uh, launch sites, and the only coastal launch site is Wenchang so far. And we've seen recently that the city of Ningbo is starting to build up a commercial launch site. And also Wenchang is interested in making their launch site more commercial. So a question for Galactic Energy, are you planning to launch from any of the coastal sites in the future? I'm thinking especially for the Palace One rocket, which is liquid fueled, which will be reusable. Are there any plans um, like that? Yeah, um, so there are two types of launch vehicles uh, being developed at Galactic Energy. One of them is called uh, Series one, which is a solid fueled rocket. The other one is called Palace One, which is a liquid fueled rocket that uses kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, for the Series One liquid fueled rocket, uh, we are planning to launch it uh, from different site launch site in in, in China, and uh, those definitely uh, include um, the ones that you, you mentioned, like like Wenchang and uh, other uh, launch site um, where. Uh, design. We are designing the the rocket to be suitable um, for for launch from different parts of the country. Um, for the solid fuel rocket, the Series One rocket, uh, currently we are we are launching it from the Jiuquan uh, Satellite Launch Center. Um, so we are actually preparing it for uh, launch from from C uh, platform in the future and. Uh, that would be a, a different uh, types of uh, opportunity for us, and uh, that would enable us to launch it to low uh, inclination orbit in the future. Um, that would open up more opportunity for us, and uh, and uh, provide more customized launch services to our customers. 
definitely. And the, the sea launch is something we covered a little bit a couple of weeks ago with what's going on over in, uh, in Yantai in Shandong. So a lot of exciting things there. Um, so moving on to our next question. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot over the last five or seven years are all the new commercial launch companies emerging from China. And this is a it's, you know, obviously we talk about it because there's lots of rockets and people notice rockets. I guess my question is that with all these new rocket companies being created, I assume that there are many subsystems level companies that are building a supply chain to supply these rocket companies with all the things they need to buy. And we don't hear so much about these subsystems level companies because they're not going and launching rockets. They're not doing, you know, big uh, hot and fire tests with their engines. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could provide a little bit of insight on how the supply chain has developed at a sort of subsystems level over these last few years, um, and you know whether that has um, been a, a significant impact for galactic energy. Um, so, as we know, there are a lot of uh, suppliers in China, state-owned suppliers and uh, private suppliers in China um, right now. Um, so before the the emergence of those uh, of the private space companies, there are already a lot of state-owned and uh, suppliers, and um, um, they have very good good product, and uh, their products are very reliable. And uh, so, I, I think as a private company, we can definitely uh, leverage that uh, resource, right? And uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of private companies. Um, emerging and in the recent years because of the uh, development of private space industry in China, ranging from, from propulsion to uh, telemetry. And we are observing a lot of more and more private enterprises enter this uh, sector and uh, they cannot, the, the quality of their product is uh, steadily improving. And uh, we are very happy to see that. Uh, so in general, we have a very broad uh, range of uh, options and uh, not both both the uh, state-owned companies and uh, private companies great that's uh that's very helpful um I, i'd like just to go back to um what we discussed early on the series one rockets you're planning five further launches in the coming in the coming year uh my question is what market do you see for the series one because today um it is generally agreed upon that most future satellites uh, that will be launched in the coming 10 years will be part of constellations and constellations will very likely go for more medium lift rockets for large scale deployment. I'm thinking of rockets like the Palace One that Galactic Energy is deploying, but maybe it's Jutra 2, maybe it's Hyperbola 2. And so Series 1 is a much smaller rocket. It's solid fueled. Um, what market do you see for this kind of rocket, especially in the very competitive environment where we see today so many Chinese rocket companies trying to build this kind of solid fueled um, small lift rocket? Yes. So, so they are designed for different market demands. The Palace One, which is a liquid fuel rocket, can carry multiple normal sized satellites in a single launch and has a strong lift capability. So like a bus, it is suitable for large scale constellation network. On the other hand, the Sirius One solid field rocket has a relatively small carrying capability, but it can provide flexible and responsive launch services to our customers, like a taxi. So Sirius One is particularly suitable for scattered launches of micro satellites or for replacing satellites in a constellation. So. So we are designing both these uh, these launch vehicles for uh, for different purposes. And so that makes me think of you know we see a lot of because we we cover a lot the the launches in China and there are you know maybe uh, scientific satellites which are lone satellites that are maybe built for by the Chinese Academy of Sciences or by a university. Uh, you can you also yeah. see the Shiyan satellites where it's generally it's just one satellite. It's not a constellation. So probably aiming for um, that kind of mission. Um, for these small yeah. rockets, um, I would guess. Yes. Um, another brief question on on market again, but this time uh, about foreign markets. Do you believe that there is a significant market for galactic energy outside of China? 
And if that's the case, um, can you tell us if Galactic Energy today is actively trying to develop their launch services outside of China? Yes, of course. Uh, we are constantly preparing our uh, launch for our overseas customers. So I, I do think Chinese commercial launch providers have market overseas. Um, Galactic Energy is able to provide well-planned launch service to customers, both domestic and abroad. In fact, we have received a lot of foreign inquiries recently as a, as a result of successful launches. I believe it. I've seen a lot of news on those successful launches, not only in the Chinese media, but also in the English language media. So if I were a foreign company looking for a Chinese launch vehicle, I would be, I'd be noticing Galactic Energy. That, that's pretty cool. Um, so just the last question from my side. So Galactic Energy, as far as I know, is a Beijing headquartered company. And Beijing, obviously, is sort of the, the main center of the Chinese space industry. Um, but Galactic Energy has also set up what looks like kind of a secondary presence in the city of Dianyang, uh, outside of, of Chengdu in Sichuan province. And this is an interesting decision from my perspective, because as far as I understand in China, you have, you know, Beijing, the center for most space sectors. And then for launch, you have Xi'an, which is kind of this old secondary launch city. Uh, and then also a little bit around the Yangtze River Delta. So typically cities like Huzhou uh, or Jiaxing or, or Suzhou, all of which have seen commercial launch companies um, relocate there in these last couple of years. So my question is, you know, what, what brought Galactic Energy to Jianyang? And, um, you know, what, what sort of, uh, what, are you, what are your plans for, for Jianyang over these next few years as an industrial base? So I think the main reason that Galactic Energy has, is uh, that Galactic Energy has received policy support from many local governments, and Jianyang is one of them. Uh, we are mm. in close collaboration with many local governments and we are, we are very uh, grateful for their support. Great. Well, and I will tell you a, a fun fact of the day, and I'm just trying to see if I can verify it before I say it. Yes, so apparently Jianyang is the home of Haidi Lao Hot Pot. The first Haidi Lao was opened in Jianyang in 1994. <laughs> so for all of those listeners out there that are interested in, in Hot Pot history, um, it gives you yet another reason to go to Jianyang, is to go visit galactic energy and to eat at possibly the world's first ever Heidi Lao. So um, on that happy note, uh, Jean, any other questions from your side? Uh, I'm good for this interview. Thank you very much, uh, Leo Hong, for taking the time to uh, to discuss with us and, you know, trying to increase awareness on what is going on in the Chinese commercial space sector to space enthusiasts um, outside of China. Liu Hong, thank you very much. You make Purdue University proud, and I say that as a Midwestern American. That's uh, so. For any Purdue University alumni out there, you can get in touch with Liu Hong. He's uh, he went to your school. So, thank you, Mr. Liu. It's uh, great speaking with you on this Sunday. It's my pleasure to to join this program. Thank you, and congratulations again on the launch. Yeah, have a great rest of your weekend. Okay, so that being said, um, just the last couple of notes from my side, then I'll turn it over to Sean for anything else. First of all, a big thanks, big thanks so far to our patrons. Uh, Jacqueline, Yuan Luck, Samson Chan, Fat Fox, Bruce Hine, JHD, and one anonymous patron um, who have gone over to our buymeacoffee.dongfanghour.com page to buy us some coffee, because as you can tell, that is what we sorely need. Um, so really, big thanks to all of our patrons. It, it, um, it's much appreciated. It, it is an honor to, um, to make content that people are willing to buy us coffee for. So from my side, that's, um, that's everything for this week. Uh, Jean, anything to add from your side? Nothing else, I guess, as usual. Um, if you're interested in more a uh, more detailed update of this week's news, you can check out our newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. We also have a website with more in-depth articles, dongfanghour.com. And I guess without any further ado, um, I'm, I'm good for the episode. And if you like what you hear, do leave us a rating or review because we don't have very many of those and it would be nice to get more ratings and reviews. It probably helps our, our search engine optimization. So if you like what you hear, don't be a, don't be a stranger. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, that's all from my side. Have a uh, have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Bye.